Friends, northerners, countrymen, lend me your ears. We go again. Out of your league, good to see you too. Mark, John, you are looking delicious. I know you did Matt Pete last week on your own. We um, did Matt Pete on his own. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. Matron. Well, <laughs> um, did we? Mark, can we talk about John's appearance first? I know he doesn't like um, people making a fuss and talking well, about, uh, you know, because there's more, there's more to life than appearances. But yeah, there's something, well, there's something well, going that's on. Well, rich, <laughs> isn't it, coming from you? There's really? something going on, John. I've never seen you. So, is there a comeback on the cards? Why are you so slim? Well, Why are you looking so ago, fit, so healthy? You were looking a bit jowly, weren't well, you? That's fat shaming. What's no, happening? No, no, I'm saying a bit jowly. Oh, HR. <laughs> Who's HR? They, they, fat they shaming. They left during COVID. No, Body just... shaming. <laughs> Flanagan. Yeah. Get him well, off. You're, you're looking well, well. Off the podcast. What are you up to? What are you doing? What's, you've got uh, something in the pipeline. It's pipeline. Is this because you're on TV? Do you, do you need to have something in the pipeline to do something different? Is it because the camera adds £10? What, no. What's going on? No, I I, uh, I drank a Guinness uh, at Christmas mm. and then wow. I got home in my pants and I looked in the mirror <laughs> and I was like, pretty much uh, genitals had disappeared behind the Kench. And I was like... Were you looking like the old melted candle? No, I was gone beyond. I've gone beyond. It was more like the candle had then gained a lot of fluid. Candle in the wind. So imagine if you melted a candle and then you injected it with fluid. So the candle had then reformed into mm. like a bulbous... So I yeah. thought, well, you look fantastic man. anyway. Well, yeah, you look good. Yeah, you do right. look good. Thanks. Uh, and we, we should at this point say, I know you guys didn't say it a couple of weeks ago, but thank you so much to Grindsmith um, for letting us use their facility throughout the uh, season. It's Pot Kettle Black. This wonderful Premier coffee shop in, coffee in Manchester, Grindsmith. In Manchester, um, John, you've taken over the TV world. I know you've been upsetting quite a few people. Salford fans again, poor old <laughs> oh Wakefield oh supporters you've on up, Sky Sports. You've upset 1,200 Salford fans. Oh, no. It was a chance for redemption. Oh, no, 1,200 people don't like me, said nobody ever. Um, you've been <laughs> slamming Aidan Caesar. Derek Bowman wants to fight you again. I mean, the Roy Keane slash the Martin Bashir of Rugby League <laughs> is Bashir, very, much, a good one, very isn't it? much in his heyday. Yeah, I'm... I'm you, you, just I'm just for a bit of context, uh, uh, someone wrote you a letter. Looked like someone he'd murdered yeah. a few people with the yes, handwriting. I think a lot of the Salford fans had, had all clubbed together mm -hmm. and wrote a letter to me in crayon. So, <laughs> dear Jan. Yeah. And they, they uh, no, no, the I got a very in. nice uh, letter off a Salford fan referring to me as the Martin Bashir of Rugby League, which, what does yeah. that mean? I think it's a compliment. Did he Before pre Michael Jackson, well? that was pre Michael Jackson yeah. documentary. Did he make it a bit political? So yeah, yeah, right the, yeah, yeah. If only they knew my true socialist beliefs. Yeah. Well. What have you got against Aiden Caesar? Just quickly, I mean, he's a friend Nothing, of the podcast. No, just, no, no he, did a, he did an interview um, before the round two game, and I was like, it was the most uninteresting few minutes I've ever heard. That's not very nice. Wow. No, it is because I was at You're setting Morgan something. Knowles up for failure here, aren't you? No, I wanted something. Is he something. coming on? What? Is he? Is Morgan Knowles coming on? I think he's coming on, yeah. Is he? Yeah, I just wanted something more from him. I thought I just wanted a bit of energy, just get me excited about the game. Yeah. Well, look, before, before we get to our wonderful guest this week, um, because congratulations, by the way, on the Sky job. You're doing a very good job. Um, I just put your name into Twitter when I was on the train coming up um, from London. Good. And uh, just, just a few thoughts here, some, some of them constructive, <laughs> some of them not so much. Um, this one from uh, Lee on Twitter, who says, heard John Wilkin and Leon Price summarising recently. Their speech sounds slurred. I wonder what effect those knocks on the head have had long term. <laughs> uh, this one from Woody, who says, John Wilkin is a whopper. Uh, Pad says, John Wilkin's not in a position to question any rugby league player's performances. <laughs> Is Kevin talking about the Channel 4 coverage says can't be worse than Sky especially now they've got that tool John Wilkin uh, Trevor says Carl Amor and then a sign to symbolise better than John Wilkin another Lee says is John Wilkin paid to be a first class bell end Luke Wilkin uh, is too much up his own arse John Wilkin with his commentary Paul says I honestly can't stand listening to John Wilkin he's such an arrogant cock <laughs> to which actually Sutkins replied to that and said thank God it's not just me and uh? Any of my tweets on there about John no, Wilkin? No, nothing came up when I put oh, you on him. Yeah. And just, just finally, this was a nice one. I thought Will Power says John Wilkin is a knob. Retweet and pass it on. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we're down. <laughs> we're, in, uh, we're in secondary school territory. Yeah. Retweet, nice. pass it on. Just a little bit of, bit of uh, constructive criticism. Uh, oh, look, let's get to our guest this week. We are joined by the wonderful Mr. Morgan Knowles from St. Yes. Helens. Morgan, thank you so much, mate, for coming in. How, how the hell are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for uh, inviting me on. Yeah, you, you got a nosebleed driving into the big city, into Manchester? Yeah, from, yeah. From the outskirts? Yeah, not my kind of places. <laughs> you know, Manchester, pretty big for me, sort of driving in, panicking, you know, a bit of a, bit of a country boy, so... <laughs> Panic attack. Look, yeah. I read somewhere that um, you once described John Wilkie, despite all that 
stuff we've just read out as as one of the biggest influences in your career is this yeah. true morgan yeah unfortunately so maybe some would say but no wilco wilco is brilliant with me sort of coming through um sort of you know come up as a, as a young lad and 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 always sort of watch wilco and and sort of admired him from from being a fan and young kids um so then sort of when i got the opportunity in the first team and sort of stepped up you know, he, he was brilliant with me, sort of being in, in, in a similar sort of position and um, always able to sort of give me advice and um, someone I'd, you know, sort of look up to and try and, you know, copy some of the, the actions and behaviours that, that he had. Not not all of them, not all of them, to be fair. Go on, I always like this because you, you've you obviously seen a lot of Morgan, the younger Morgan Knowles. Mm -hmm. When you first laid eyes on him, what did you think? Because you suss people out quite yeah. quickly, don't you? No, nah, no, nah, I just, what I saw was the real deal, like, as in lots of people come into performance environments you know whatever it is whatever sport mm. and and you know when somebody comes in who has absolutely just got all of the constituent parts to make you fantastic mm. and morgan was one of those from day one you know and he's overplaying how much influence i had i think all i wanted to do was try and let him know how good he is tell his parents how good he was and just make sure that he made the most of of the things that he had at his disposal mm. um it's the easiest stuff ever that, you know, when a player like Morgan comes into your team. Mm. Um, the harder bits is when it's somebody who you don't think is any good. Mm. You know, that's <laughs> tough. What do you do in that case? Well, no, but it, you, you're sort of in a similar position as a senior sort of player, but without the conviction of belief behind mm. it. Mm. Whereas I always believed Morgan would be... In fact, you know, my last year at Saints, we were playing a, a similar sort of time to each other. And I was like, I knew he was better than me at mm. that. You know, he'd, he'd gone past me by some level at that point, mm. you know, um, which was a weird situation because I was like buzzing, but then also because I'm narky and competitive, it still makes you feel a bit like, you know. Oh, you felt he was a bit of a threat? No, it was more than a threat, Will. You know, he was, he was better than me, you know. But then that says something about you, and I know it's not often I give you a compliment, because there are a lot of people, I don't know, Morgan, tell me if I'm wrong, Mark, tell me if I'm wrong, in clubs where people, you know, who are 10 years older, it's about right, isn't it? 10 to 14 yeah, yeah. years older, maybe, yeah. um, who wouldn't give you the time of day and wouldn't help nurture you and, and want to make the best out of your career. Mark, ever come across those guys in your career who don't make it so easy for talented youngsters to come through, people they may be threatened by? <sighs> From memory, there's a couple, I could imagine a couple of bitter players that probably self-preservation was at the forefront of their minds. But Do you have names and addresses? Um, yeah, a couple. I can. No, I wouldn't say, but uh, yeah, I think. But I think the, just, the vast majority of rugby league players care about winning and they care about the club they play for. And if um, if you're just looking after yourself, and you've not got your, the, the club's best interests at heart, and mm. it'd be wrong for John or myself prior to that at Saints to um, stifle a player like Morgan coming through just because we'd be selfish and look after ourselves, I think. Mm. Should we go right back, right, right back, but well before you, you joined Saints and, and came through there, um, to being, well, I mean, you're 25 now, Morgan, aren't you? Great age, great, great age. age. It's a great age. It's a great age, 25. Do you feel like it's a great age? It's a great age. Good yeah. time, good time. Seems, seems, seems to have gone a big, like, big, big, pretty big, quick. Big old big arms on him, isn't he? Thanks. Big old guns Thanks. on the lad. <laughs> Um, but look, you, so you were born in Barrow and Furness, right? Which essentially, for people who don't have an atlas, uh, is kind of, it's referred to sometimes as the end of the longest cul-de-sac in, in England. It's sort of, you go up, don't you, into the Lake District, and you come down all the way down like a really long, thin yeah. sort of stretch, and you were born there. God, what, was, what was childhood like there? Yeah, really good. Um, born in Barrow. Um, sort of grew up in a little town, Olverston, sort of South Lakes. Um, was always sort of outside growing up. My my dad was a, an outdoor pursuits teacher, so Amazing. I was always sort of at weekends canoeing, climbing, all those sorts of things, getting out on the on the hills. Um, and brilliant, and, and and sort of played rugby. My dad played rugby union, and, and my brother played, so so I got into it from an early age. Sat down at Olveston, and um, later moved to sort of Barrow Island, was where I played my my amateur career. Mm. Um, and yeah, just sort of was, was league through a there. thing at all in Barrow back then? Yeah, yeah, no. So it's all it's all league in Barrow really. There's only there's only a handful but the of union still clubs. Big up there. Cumbria, Mark Quato's from there, isn't he? Cumbria, Steve Hanley. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a couple of clubs, but um, mainly it's 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 league up in Cumbria. Yeah, 
That, that sounds like an unbelievable child, isn't yeah, it? Dad, yeah. an outdoor pursuits instructor. It's like the dream, isn't it? Yeah, that no call of duty for, for, for Knowles as a kid. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Definitely appreciate it now from sort of coming away and, and living away from it. Was he always into outdoor pursuits, your old man? Yeah, yeah. He, was, he sort through. of got into that and sort of played and, and, and travelled around and, and then sort of realised his love for just, just sort of being outside and, and doing that. And yeah, that's what he still does What's now. What's his favourite? Pursuit in the outdoors. Oh. Um, <laughs> like like sailing, just uh, you know, getting away. He's on his top. I have a bit of a laugh, me and my brother, because he tends to just disappear. No one knows where he is. Mm. Tells me, Mum, I'm going off for a week, ten days. He might not be doing any of that. <laughs> we that's might, what John's dad does. Yeah, he's moonlighting. That's not around like the golf, that is it. I'm stuck for a week, <laughs> ten days. <so> he <laughs> it just seems sailing off <laughs> off Barrow Island like that, and a submarine, <laughs> a little one-man submarine. Well, he's yeah. back in a week. I don't know, he might come out. He might be having, having some spa day somewhere and, and just got his feet <laughs> resting. But getting a break from his mum, I think. So, can you pinpoint that first moment where rugby came into your life? Do you remember a time? Um... I sort of always, always watched, watched rugby really at home. So my, so my dad was into it and I remember sort of watching sort of the, the Six Nations and because my dad was sort of rugby union and just always having sort of a ball around. Can't really remember sort of it not being um, sort of a part of our life as a, a, as a family. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and, and sort of remember my first game and, and just sort of just, yeah, absolutely sort of loving it and loving tackling mainly. It wasn't sort of, Bothered about the ball, oh, you but fell in love with that. I just contact. like the physical side of it, and um, yeah, sort of. Were still you a big for really. a kid? Not really. I was a bit of a chubby chode. Because chode. I always find the best yeah. defenders were always small as a kid because they had to work harder at the technique and be a bit tougher because they couldn't let the physical attributes take over. Yeah, I reckon I reckon that's still the case now. I think the lads that are bigger coming through mm. tend to be a little little bit sort of mentally weaker because they've always found it easy and and you know maybe some of the smaller kids have to try a bit harder and always sort of punching above the weight a little bit um, sort of toughens them up. Yeah, the Lake District is one of the most stunning places in Class. the world, isn't it? It's isn't amazing, it? It's got to yeah, be. Amazing. I mean, even like Americans come over and they're like, oh, my even God. Americans. No, but it is. It's it's one of the, it's one of the. Oh my. One of the wonders of the world, isn't it? It's a stunning, stunning place. You've you've recently bought a place there. You're letting it out. This you're already thinking about like these two. You're thinking about life after rugby. You know, bit of a few, bit of a business venture. <laughs> yeah, trying to trying to think and um, sort of yeah, like you said, life after rugby. So I bought a little little holiday up in the lakes. Um, so we've sort of had that going, renting out for about a month now. So that's what's going. That, what's that called? Lake Away Hideout. Lake Away if you want to have a look sounds, on sounds Instagram, nice, give us a follow. So this is the beginning of something. They're just testing it out, seeing how it how it goes. Yeah, yeah. Sort of see how it goes. Obviously, sort of prices of staying up in the lakes. There's not too many sort of accommodations up there, and mm. um, you know, hopefully that can that'll go pretty well for me. Yeah, and and look, you are a, an advocate, aren't you? Things I've read online before about more being done for rugby in Cumbria, for rugby league in Cumbria. Now, John, we've had you on this subject before. Yeah. And I think you were quite critical about it. I wasn't it. critical, I was just giving my opinion. I should just leave you two to, to go at it there. No, I mean. my, my opinion is if you've anyone's been to Cumbria, it's very sparsely populated. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's its challenge is the geography of it, which a lot of people who are interested live very far apart. Mm. So when you bring them all together, if there's seven, eight, 10,000, they've got to travel two and a half. It's like, Barrow to Whitehaven is how far? Yeah, it's about the same as uh, Barrow to Whitehaven, the same as what I was travelling, sort of data training and yeah. settling. So, mm. you know. It's a very big space, isn't it? That's my only point. Is like we say Cumbrian Rugby League, I, I believe grassroots would be all across the, you know, where it's played should be invested in. Yeah. It's just the challenge the of practicality. Yeah, yeah. And, and what you'd have to do is merge maybe three or four entities that have got a hundred year history and get them to agree in a spot in Cumbria, probably maybe somewhere in Grassmere. Oh, yeah, nice place. central and just go right now. We're going to play rugby league here. It's just mm. a lot of challenges. So, is, it, is this a passion in your head, or have you thought it further forward? Have you got a plan here? No, I, I think it's, it's difficult. Like Wilco said, you've got sort of white and working up sort of north Cumbria, and, and they're sort of you know, sort of fierce rivals, and mm. you wouldn't get them joining together. And, and then Barrow's the opposite end, and um, I think it'd have to be some sort of um sort of middle ground, you know, you know, maybe maybe if you got somewhere in the lakes and um you know the the three other clubs and maybe some sort of feeder team. 
there's a massive thirst for it though isn't it i mean we did, mark we had carl amore talking about it because he's yeah. a cumbria boy isn't he yeah. and and he was saying exactly the same uh, thing very passionate about it because he because he's seen firsthand the the desire yeah, that yeah. you know that it can build with yeah and many of there's many good players up there that probably get left behind by not having a super league team or mm. you know a strong club up there because there's, there's so much talent but they probably don't get enough eyes on them as, as they should do, which is, I'd be interested to know uh, Morgan's story as, as he came, to, how, how he came to Saints and how much mm. travelling and all the rest he had to do. But um, yeah, it's, it, there's definite, there's massive interest up there. It's probably... Didn't Kukash float the idea of it at one stage? He's floated a few ideas, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, he's a bit of a floater he's himself. A floater, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, yeah Marwan's got lots of ideas. Yeah, on, on that though as well, one thing people rarely forget to mention when you talk about Cumbrian Rugby League, is the influence of Sellafield, which is a, like a nuclear facility obviously housed up in Cumbria. They pay fantastic money for people to go and work there. Mm. So I know a few lads who were playing youth, they were good, maybe at Wigan or at St. Helens. And, and they go on to like 75, 80K a year, plus playing rugby on a weekend. Mm. They're on six figures and not playing professionally. Yeah. And then they get offered what, Eighteen thousand pounds a year to come and play professional rugby for St. Helens. Yeah, they're already driving a nine eleven. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? What are we? You know, so com commercially, actually, for a lot of young guys in that area, especially in Whitehaven and Workington, mm. actually working at Sellafield is much more profitable. Yeah, well, you only worked nine to eleven when you were in Hull on the pig farm, didn't you? Before you, <laughs> it's, it's you long started. hours on the pig farm. What? Well, just, just finally on, on Cumbria before we move on and talk about your early career, Morgan. Um, that is a, quite a fascinating idea, I think, about. Like you said, Mark, people not being spotted. The amount of young Morgan Knowles out there that, that will never get a chance that, because of geography. Yeah, you know, I think when I was coming through, there was, I was never sort of the best. There was, there was lots of lads that were better than me and um, for sort of one reason or another. And you just sort of, you know, they just get left behind and end up sort of, you know, playing amateur. You know, if I was fortunate, you know, my, my parents... Um, you know, they sort of drove me up and down and, and showed that sort of massive commitment where, you know, n not everyone's sort of as lucky as, as myself and had that. So, mm. you know, if clubs are, are not willing to sort of put lads up and, and, and do that when, you know, potentially there be a, a similar standard of player living down in Wigan that can just drive the training, then, you know, what, what would be, what's did, the point? Did you feel you were putting that pressure on your parents as a kid? Because obviously you've got to kind of in your head almost back yourself and think, I know I'm good enough to make this. It's quite a, a lot of pressure for a young kid, right? It's not just being like driven down the road in Manchester, is it, to Wigan and, and to, to St. Helens? Yeah, I probably probably didn't really think it at the time, but um, probably looking back now, you know, sort of realising that, you know, there probably was was a bit of pressure on me to, to try and, you know, give it my best crack. But um, I always knew that I would give it my, my best crack. And if, if that wasn't good enough, then I would have been happy that, you know, that I'd done that and I, and, and I think me, me mum and dad would have been as well. They, they've been a huge support for you, haven't they? Like an incredible support. Should I support. give a shout out? You know, parents. Yeah, parents, Big Mac and Ali. They're, they're a Mac huge part of anyone's mm. career, but, mm. you know, Morgan's parents in yeah, particular. Yeah, for that, for that commitment from parents, is, if for that travel and the amount of hours put in, it's huge. And yeah, do I you, think Do you I, appreciate that as kids? Do no, you? I was going to say, at the time you don't, and I don't think that's just being ruder and grateful. It's just you probably just see the, the world in a different light. And I know mm. my mum, I was li living in Oldham, um, playing for Bradford Bulls when I was 16, 17, couldn't drive. And my mum used to take me Tuesday, Thursdays. It'd be an hour and a half that she'd hang around, around shopping around TK Maxx or whoever, and then drive me home. It'd be like a five hour round trip for her twice a week. Mm. So Sue Flam did a lot for me as well. So yeah, at the time you don't realise it, but looking back, they kind of, but the, the, Parents are just proud of you, aren't they? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not, it's and not it's an investment in their time, but in that time they've invested in you, you've got the chance to develop skills, become really competent. And that's the beauty of like great parenting. It just gives you the chance to practice, mm. doesn't it? Like bad parenting in that situation denies kids the chance of practicing. And, and I think one thing that we've probably all got in common in terms of our rugby stories is mm. our parents gave us an unbelievable chance to practice and practice a lot, mm. you know, and that's something everyone should acknowledge, you know, in their own journey. My wife, her, her parents really invested in her being able to practice. It's mm. a massive sacrifice at the time, but the rewards are there. Yeah. Morgan, you've had some huge praise, right? Uh, I'm sure you've seen these before. Uh, your Wales coach at the time, we'll talk about changing from Wales to England a little later. Um, John Keir says uh, that he would 
love a team of 17 Morgan Knowles. Uh, James Roby says Morgan epitomises everything that a rugby league player should be. Sean Wayne says uh, Morgan is the next Sean O'Loughlin. Mark Flanagan once said Morgan Knowles is quite good. Um, I'm a big high, fan. High, 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 afraid. <laughs> Look, you said, John, when you first saw him as a kid that you knew he would be the real deal. Describe yeah. him now as a 25-year-old. Well, he's the best player in Super League. Oof. We'll put that on the back of the DVD. He's the best player in Super League. That's why Front I went... The DVD. There were some people being tossed up as who we get on the podcast. Mm. And the reason that I pushed to have Morgan on here more than anybody else is because I firmly believe he's the best player in Super League by some stretch. And that's not on any metric that you measure, you know... On, from the broadcasting side of things, we love showing people who score tries. There's way more exciting attacking players than Morgan Knowles. But I reckon if you had a show of hands in the league at the minute, I don't think he'd be far off being voted the best player in the comp from the players. Mm. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. that. That's why, you know, it's high praise, but it's not built on anything other than really solid foundations. That's what interests me about Morgan mm. is what's inside here and why... You know, we'll get into it. We'll work with why he does it. You know, yeah. why he plays like he does. You know, and that's well. I, I love this quote, and uh, Morgan. I don't know if you even remember saying this, but and tell me if you didn't, because then we'll just edit this bit out. Um, we never edit anything out of this podcast. No. Uh, I, I love this because I, I found it and it, I, I wrote it down because I thought it was fascinating. I always knew that I wanted to be a success. I had to be good at the mental side of the game, and that's what would set me apart. I've never been the most talented, fastest, or the strongest, but I will do the things that others won't. When games are tough. I will never look for an easy way out. Other people will break before I do. So that mental side to me, because like you said, you're not, you, I mean, you're five foot 11 with your Cuban heels on, aren't you? Six yeah. foot Wiki says, but you know, we've edited five marks five down 11. to five foot seven. Uh, yeah, five foot 11 and a half. <laughs> when 11 and a half. half. <laughs> oh, oh, no, we should chance to lie. No, no. With, your, with your Alexander McQueen's on. Yeah, um, yeah. Go on, so where, did, where does that mental side come from? And, and is that something that just kicked in when you were this 12 year old and Saints like the look of you at Barrow Island or what? Um, I think so. Like sort of said in that, I, you know, I was never the best. I was never more skillful. Never sort of um, physically quickest, fastest, strongest, anything like that. Um, so I knew if I, if I if I wanted to do anything, I, I wanted to sort of give it a crack. Then it'd have to be sort of on effort-based areas and and you know being sort of the mental side of the game and tough and fit and, and things that I could, you know, sort of control, um, you know, and, and, and that's sort of what I try and base my game on. And, um, you know, I think if, if, if I have a bit of a poor game or, or, or even sort of big game, sort of go back to, to what I sort of hang me out on is, is sort of is hard work and, and, and doing things that uh, are not sort of desirable or, or things like that. But I think, you know your teammates sort of appreciate and and sort of cleaning up and mm. and those, those sort of ugly side side of the game. I, could, I mean, I, I could tell he was a mentor for you because that's the kind of thing I could hit, imagine Wilkins saying, even though he wouldn't say it out loud. But other people will break before I will, and, and you must have measured that somewhere before. You must have been with people at 13, 14, 15 coming through where you know they maybe had more talent than you, but you had that mental side and you knew that was going to take you further than them. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I, I... Um, it's not something I sort of, you know, sort of work on or think about too much. I think it's something that um, I probably just had and, and maybe sort of me, me, mum and dad and, and I have been sort of brought up of mm. sort of never giving up and, and just sort of giving your best and leaving it all out there. You can't coach that, can you? You can't instill that in someone? Um, I think good coaching can, can help because positive reinforcement, if you've got a young athlete who does things that you like and then you're telling him that you like them, he's undoubtedly going to try and do that you know, more, you know, your parents reinforcing that, you know, that will to compete and to never give in is, is important. But good coaching can, can, can help refine that in somebody, I mm. think. You can have that deep down. There's loads of people with dog in them who, who want to scrap and who, who want, like, will not give in. Mm. If they got in a street fight, you, they, they just wouldn't give up. Mm. But there's not many people have the discipline and the, the consistency to be committed to a craft over a long enough period of time to execute that. But good coaching and great parenting can help. I think it's nurtured over a long time as well. I don't think it's one of them you can flick a, flick a switch and automatically you become competitive and have that never say die attitude. I, mm. I think it's probably it's nurtured over a long time through probably uh, a bit of hard, hardship, whether that's not being small or not being good enough, you'll kind of keep plugging away. And over, over a long period of time, you develop habits. And like John said, Coaching and good parenting can encourage that, but I think you need some 
that, that little bit of fire in your belly that you, you don't want to lose and, and you, you never give up. Mm. What was that time like before the 2016 essentially breakthrough season when you were around the first team, training with the first team, John, your memories of that as well, when you, you, you knew that you were going to have a real shot at it. It wasn't just a case of let's just try this kid out and send him out on loan and whatever. You were, you were going to be in the first team. And look, fast forward to here in 2022 and you're going for a fourth straight grand final. Well, it probably wasn't like that, really, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I only sort of stepped up to the first team on, on an academy contract. I think it was me and another lad academy contract. So, I, you know, didn't have a first team one and basically sort of just given the opportunity of, of right, well, let him, let him have a crack pre-season, see how he goes. You know, it'll be good for him. But I was never looking for, uh, or I don't think there was any intention that, uh, you know, I was going to play much at all. Um, but that sort of first pre-season just, just sort of took everything in, just loved it, just just being a, a, around the lads and, and all the professionalism that came with sort of a full-time environment and just sort of bought into everything. Um, what was that first hit like? Did you, did you feel like there was a magnifying glass on you? Because obviously you want to make an impression and you're up against the likes of Wilkin and his friends. Yeah, you know, you know it's tough. It's, it's, it's quite daunting. I don't think I, I spoke much at all, did I? You know, when I, when I first sort of come in and just sort of keep my head down and, and you know, wouldn't say anything to any of the... The senior players, you know, was um, you know quite quite a, maybe a nervous character, or just just sort of quiet, but just um, just yeah, just wanted to get stuck in really, and and any sort of opportunity I had, um, you know, with, with Wilco was was you know getting stuck into him and, and trying to uh, make a point to to Kez, who was the coach then, that you know that I didn't want to just sort of make up the numbers and, and wanted to have a crack. But I guess, it's, I guess it's difficult, isn't it, for a, a kid at the time yeah. to be yourself. It's easy, isn't it, for you just to go, just calm down, be yourself, relax. But you want to make an impression. You don't want to upset any people. You, you, like you say, just want to keep yourself to yourself and, and impress the guys that, that make the decisions. Well, senior players have also been kids, though, you know what I mean? Mm. So you've got to have that ability to empathise, take your ego out of situations and understand what's going on. I think I played with a lot of players who couldn't deal with young lads coming in and putting it on them in training. Mm. You know, it'd be almost like frowned upon if you put it on a senior player in training. And I was like, to me, that's crazy because, you know, if you look at Saints now, they've got James Roby at the top of the tree and he would never accept anything less than true competition at training. Mm. And, yeah, you know, I think it's, uh, it's a difficult situation as a young guy going into a team full of people who you've probably admired and people who are being paid top dollar to do something that they're very good at. That's a difficult environment. But you know what happens in really difficult environments is the most strongest, tough, robust people survive. Mm. So it's an environment where you either go in and you're good yeah. or you get fucked off yeah, yeah. real quick. You know, and that's sport, isn't it? Yeah. And it, it, should it be softer and a bit more gentle and allow? Well, no, because you need to find that out there and then. I don't believe if there's some characters come in and you could give them five, six years and it'd be really nice and gentle. And I think we're losing a bit of this over time. And I understand why harsh sort of working environments and consciousness of welfare of people and individuals. But if it was the Marines, mm. you wouldn't see them accept behaviours that risk their life. No, because you need to prepare the players for the game and it's ruthless and tough out there. So the environment of, of training and, and being around other, each other needs to replicate that in a way, mm. doesn't it? Yeah. Sure. When, when did the sense of I deserve to be here kick in? Because you made your debut 2015, didn't you? But the breakthrough season was 16 and that was only a year, your debut after Saints won the grand final and Mark played at halfback at Old Trafford. I don't know if you've probably if you got rid of me for Mark Morgan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, then the I'm not bitter. I'm door. not bitter. <laughs> Took him out in a coffin. Um, but I, you know, do you know what I mean? When, when did it sort of, when did you, when did the nerves wear off and you thought like, yeah, I'm, I'm on this stage because I deserve to, to be here and, and then you can start to be yourself around these guys. Um, probably sort of progressively over time. I don't think it was sort of one point. Um, but probably fairly fairly recently, really, I think. So I've always carried that little bit of sort of imposter syndrome of of being here, and um, yeah, probably probably fairly recently that you know I'm, I'm sort of comfortable mm. in in myself and and know what I bring and um, sort of you know with that sort of then potentially being a, you know a little bit more vocal in the group and and sort of passing on sort of my thoughts. And That's amazing, until only recently, bearing in mind you've, you've won the last three grand finals. And it's kind of, I, imposter syndrome fascinates me. Tell us more about that, of, of I guess a sense, because I want to get into the topic with you of being the unsung hero. 
You agree with that, John, yeah, don't you? You know, I mean, you've just said he's the best player in Super League right now. Yeah. I mean, that is, that's a massive statement. Yeah. And, and you mean it, and I know you yeah. do. But there's still a side to you that people think you don't get the credit that you deserve. You've said that Saints don't get the credit for, the, for what they deserve, and we'll talk about that as well. But imposter syndrome and, and you being an unsung hero is, is a really interesting... I mean, you could do a two hours podcast yeah. on that. 100%. Yeah, I don't know, really. I think, um, you know, I, I sort of just come in and, and I was just just wanted to sort of do my job and, and sort of get respect off off uh, the lads I was playing with and and, and the way I was sort of going to do that was was sort of like I said you know working hard doing doing the uh, the sort of unselfish sort of things and um, you know and, and just sort of maybe sort of didn't really sort of put a value on that until you know maybe sort of fairly recently of, of how important that is and um, so yeah, it's just, it's just sort of how, how it, I was. Is really. it Mark, is it the uh, the ugly, unrewarding work? Is that why it's not? You know, you're not on the the pedestal every week. Well, you don't get the plaudits you deserve, really. I think probably uh, Morgan, John, and myself played all, all, all played loose forward and played a similar role in, in each team we played for. And I think you don't get the credit you deserve exter externally, but internally mm -hmm. you do. And I think um, that probably could play, play a part in in that imposter syndrome. But I think the, those that are closest to him in the team and as a coaching staff would reward and, and, and recognise your efforts probably more than anybody, wouldn't they? Yeah, and I, th I think that's, that's one thing we've got, you know, really good now at Saints is, um, and sort of when Justin came in, you remember Wilco, that we started rewarding those sort of, sort of efforts and, and um, those, those sort of things, um, you know, starts to sort of change the culture a little bit, doesn't it? The things that you reward is is your culture, and um, you know, as a group, you know, we started to started to do that. You know, kick pressures or um, diving on scraps, and 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 those sorts of sorts of things that you know your average fan watching doesn't see, but as a group, you know, that's really valuable to us, and and you know, those things would be applauded before you know a, a Regan Grace full length try. Yeah, you know, for example. Yeah, when, when do we start singing about unsung heroes? Because that that seems to have shifted yeah. in in sporting culture. Doesn't well, it's, it? be, it's been that song's being sung within changing rooms, as mm. Mark says. Mm. You know, with it, within organisations, you know, doing those things well. It's not like they're uncool or or dirty things. At Saints, you'd have a whiteboard after games, mm. and all of a sudden, on that whiteboard was things that were unnoticed but became high value to us. Mm. Little efforts that didn't mean an awful lot but to us over a period of time meant just a change in mindset. Mm. And you've seen that cultivated Saints. And talk about Saints winning, you know, three finals on the spin. It was started when Justin Holbrook came in and it was started through a forensic attention to detail in little areas that people were overlooking that mattered. And Saints now do those areas better than anyone else mm. every week. And, you know, it, I, it's hard for me because I'm a pundit now. Mm. And so it'd be it'd be so much easier for me as a pundit if Saints were shit, because you know I, I think I get accused of of not not being biased. Look, I, I obviously love the club and I've played for them for a long time, but quite simply, they are the best team at the minute, and it's built on detail and small details that other teams simply have not worked out matter. Saints know they matter. Mm -hmm. Saints do it better than anybody else. And just a really quick one on, on the imposter syndrome. I think we, everyone in life has it, right? Yeah. If you haven't got it, you, you, you're, you're a sociopath. Mm. Well, Mark, yeah. has, you, Mark has it. If you don't feel... It's, weekly, it's, got, it's being modest yeah. internally about what you're doing in life. Mm. But just to pick on what John was saying there, I think pr uh, external praise for the unsung heroes will come with greater understanding of the game. Mm. Like I think people don't understand the impact that... Morgan doing a kick chase or kick pressure mm. or picking up scraps or let's, uh, um, try saving tackles or giving other people time and space, which he does really well, like Sean Wayne said about Sean O'Loughlin. Yeah. It's a lot of unselfish acts that he does. And I think people understanding the game with great pundits like John Wilkin explaining <laughs> will go a long way to, to doing it. And I think that's, that's one thing that, that, that 
I think hopefully fans can, can see this guy and many other Saints players doing is, is the unselfish acts because that's what wins them the trophy. Well, that's your jobs, isn't it? Both yeah. of you as, as pundits and, and to yeah, highlight yeah. that area because I mean, even it's very hard to highlight. Yeah, I will say that as in, but anal it comes with analysis, doesn't it? It does, it does, but when you've got such tight timelines on the shows that yeah. you're on. If, if there was a magazine programme midweek that could focus on the details that really matter in rugby league, yeah. then I think we could get into what would we kick call pressure, that? working from John market. Wilkins, sure. No. E I John Wilkins, extra. Um, I don't know. No, because I mean, I get, look, I guess it's fine on that. It, it's over years hasn't been seen as the sexy stuff even though it is one of the most important roles yeah. i mean look the because it looks it, it's not sexy to look at is it do you know mm. what i mean is mm. what do you want to do watch morgan put his body in the line 50 times and then when you watch it back i always find as well i don't know if you're the same as me Morgs, you make a tackle or you wrestle in a game or you yeah. win a rook and you think you go back to watch your clips and you go that was you know you're looking forward to seeing it and then you see it and it's always yeah, it's it's not, never it's as, not good. as good as it's you thought it was. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. I just smashed him. No, I didn't. And I was just going to say, no, the, the football equivalent being, look at Fernandinho, look at N'Golo Conte. Those roles were not celebrated no, no. Right, 10 yeah. years ago. And now it's kind of, whoa, everyone wants to be that sort of Makaleli player. Um, look, let's talk about the winning machine. We've done this so many times about St. Helens. And it, it, again, it's a really intriguing conversation because you've obviously been part of this St. Helens team that, as we mentioned a few times, going for a fourth grand final victory on the trot. Leeds have done three, so it would be new territory, wouldn't it, to, to a Super League team. Challenge Cup last year as well. You've said, Morgan, that Saints don't get the credit that they deserve. Just elaborate on that a little bit more. We've said it about you personally. What about as the team? Yeah, well, I probably said that and I was already a couple of cans deep after the grand final <laughs> doing an interview. But it, um, came from, it came from somewhere. It came from the heart. But yeah. I do, yeah, I, I think... Um, and it's hard to compare different teams from from you know different eras, and uh, you know I know the Leeds team was not so long ago, but and Bradford won before that. Um, but I think if you if you sort of look at the stats and you're a bit of a sort of stat man, and you see what we've done over the last you know probably four years, um, you know that win percentage along with you know picking up league leaders, Challenge Cup, you know and Grand Finals, then you know we sort of out exceed those those other teams that we get sort of compared to. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, maybe it's sort of British culture, but we like to see people sort of fail and, and yeah. you know, and especially like grand final with Catalan getting there. And, you know, I think we were sort of portrayed in the media as, as sort of the bad guys and, and, and everyone, if you weren't a Saints fan, wanted Catalan to win. And, you know, and probably rightly so, because I would have if I was a neutral. Um, but... I think for us, we sort of use that as, as, as a bit of motivation of, you know, everyone's against us, a bit of backs against a wall. Um, but yeah, potentially, you know, especially in the media, not, not getting the, the credit we deserve at times. It's how, how British is that? It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. So you've got like one of, I'll, I'll bring in something that I've mentioned to you earlier today, but you've got one of the most successful sporting teams in the country playing a French team when the overriding sentiment in the north of England is Brexit, mm. <laughs> playing our champion team, yet the team supported were the French team. <laughs> the irony. Yeah. The irony. Yeah. It's so, it's so British. Yeah, I, I think... But that, it, is, it is British, because like, as an example, you know, and, and you said it spot on there, Morgan, that it's a British, a UK cultural thing that we, we only really respect and appreciate serial winners when they lose or when they fall from grace I mean look at the, the states you know the Pats aren't seen as Manchester United in, in the NFL you know the Lakers the Chicago Bulls were all during these great decades of just winning and winning and winning and winning but you, you are seen as the kind of evil guys with capes when you, when, you, when you dominate and actually really you know three isn't dominating isn't it four, five, six maybe dominating you, you're at that stage now where we can start to talk about a, a team that can dominate a sport and no one likes that look at Manchester United everyone hates Manchester United Apart from United fans, true. Yeah, yeah. But it's, and it's probably quite hard to say because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, st I'm still in it. It's not, we've not sort of ended. You know, we're we're hoping to to go on and, and do four this year. Um, so it's you know potentially said a, a, a bit premature, but um, yeah. Where does that mindset come from? Is it the media to build people up and then knock them down? Well, do you what, have you seen the Wayne Rooney documentary? Not yet. No, I've heard it's really. Like, good. If, if anybody gets a chance, I'd watch the Wayne Rooney documentary because I sort of watched it um, just casually while I was cooking dinner one night. And I just, you know, they started going through the things he'd achieved and the teams he played for and the amount of titles he won. And regardless of all that, the overriding sentiment is Wayne Rooney's a bit of a bum. 
Mm. You know, he hasn't. You know what I mean? He's, he's like, and I couldn't understand where the negativity he has about this. thrown quite a bit of fuel into that fire. Doesn't yeah, he? maybe, but I just think you've got to look in people's achievements in isolation as well, away from all the other gubbins that maybe got attached to him and whatnot. I don't, I don't know. I think we do like. We're cynical, aren't we? Mm. We like negative stories. You know. Good you, news. People good only news. want you to be good for so long, don't they? They want to bring Bad you down. Do you, do you sense that, that people already want to bring this Saints team down? Not just teams that you play against, because you're everyone's cup final now, home and away. But fans, the media, the general riffraff of rugby league. Yeah, yeah, we definitely definitely sense that. Um, like you said, media media and fans, and, and we know all the teams are sort of coming for us. And, you know, I think we, we sort of accepted now that every time we play, whoever we do, we're playing their best because they know they're playing against us. They know they've got to raise their game and, and, and step it up to our level or, or you know, it's generally not going to be so good for them. So we we, we know where we're at and we know, um, you know, that the challenges of that face. Do you enjoy that or em embrace it as personally and as a playing squad? Um, yeah, well, I think especially especially the grand final, I think, you know, we, we definitely use that as, as motivation. Um, and obviously, you know, we're only two games into the season, so, you know, we've not really had so much of that yet. But, um, yeah, it is. It is. We, know, we know everyone's sort of against us and, and it is who's in that group, who's in that, that sort of changing room. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's on us to, um, you know, our destinies and our, our hands in it, really. So, some clubs use it as a siege mentality, don't they? Yeah. If they're, they're, there's a bit of hatred and resentment from the outside, they'll kind of create a really strong identity inside as like it's every, the world against us I think cl some clubs do that flash I, do the All Blacks do that? Do no that? I think some clubs do that but my experience of doing that is when the shit is the fan you do it sometimes mm. you know like the media's out to get us somebody said this about us mm. you know there's an article about us here they don't respect us the beautiful position that Saints are in at the minute is they are the best yeah mm. The difference is different between whipping a horse that's not running so quick Saints are galloping out front like but this is the this is the rub. Like, how the fuck you stay there? Mm. You need motivation. You need hunger from somewhere. Yeah. You need to find, like, this drive to keep going. You know, wh where does that come from? What, wh when, when does that stop? Because it'll stop. Yeah. Saints aren't going to be successful forever. Mm. So what's the point? This is where if we could, like, apply, like, scientific sort of experiment to it is Saints are now on this trajectory of brilliance. It'll stop at some stage. Mm why and what happened to make it change. Is it James Roby retiring? Well, no, but that could be used, couldn't it? You know, yeah. Leeds with, with Sinfield and Peacock and all yeah. that, that, you know, that was used as, as a reason. The Wigan, what, what about Wigan in the 1990s? Yeah. Like, you couldn't see that ever ending at a period, you know? Some amazing teams, Castleford in the 80s, you know, Hull, Hull KR in the 80s, amazing witness. Yeah. You know, amazing teams, but all of these amazing sides have a start and a finish. But th then I guess, uh, you know, look at the Saints Academy and look at the, the products that have come through that. And it's about having the next generation already ready to rumble, isn't it? You know, the a football equivalent being when Pep Guardiola leads Manchester City. What happens like when he left Barcelona? So that, that's a massive question, actually, Morgan. And I don't know, it's kind of throwing you right on the spot to try and even begin to answer it. But how you su sustain success? Is that something that's even talked about at the club? I think it's I think it's sort of with the culture really. You know, you obviously spoke about James Roby there. You know, he he heads that, he leads that. Um, you know, everything he does leads by example, and and that sort of trickles down really. And um, talk about some of the the things that we value as a team and sort of get put up on a pedestal. Um, those things, and then when when the young lads come through, it's sort of trying to relay that message of you know that stuff. You know, we don't have that here, and these are the standards that you need to be at, or you won't be here any longer. Mm. And um, I think we've had that for a sustained period now, where our standards are there, and now they're that's the norm. So it's. But is there a paranoia, like John says, that it, there is a day when it comes to an end, or there has to be a day when? There's a lot of timing in it, though, Will, mm. as well, because you talk, you mentioned some of this. You know, I think really the right thing is that succession of junior players is really important to like maintaining a, a, a successful sort of culture. But I'll use Morgan as an example now. He's number 13 at St. Helens. Mm. He's going to be a custodian of that shirt for maybe the next 10, 12 years. In 12 years time, maybe come back two or three years. So in, in nine, 10 years time, they need somebody mm. to step into that shirt. And... 
And it is somewhat for me in the lap of the gods that that happens in the right way. I use Leeds as an example of that. Is you know, they had a number of players who sort of wound down at a similar time. Mm. They've got a brilliant academy, one of the best, one of the best academies. But at that time, bringing young players in, yeah. they're just not the right players. But it's all the pieces in it as well. You know, yeah. you lose a Brian McDermott. It's not, it's not just yeah, those no, players, no, it's, it's, it's the coach. The, 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 the retirement of players has been quite incredible at Saints as well. If you look back to 2014, when I played and we won the grand final, probably half the squad who played in that game are still playing now. Mm. And they would have had Regan, Grace and Morgan coming through the academy at that point. Mm. So eight years ago, probably 10 of the 17 that play week in, week out now were there then. So when you talk about culture, it's so much easier to, 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 to carry on those habits um, if you've got the same people there. So mm. I think when Leeds had issues, not issues, but it all seemed to happen quite quickly, was because all the figureheads retired at the same time. I think they've had a really good succession of keeping the same players, keeping that consistency on the field, and that's why they've been so successful these last four years. Yeah, high turnaround rarely equals good. Yeah. Rarely. Yeah. Unless you're just shit and then you need turnaround mm. and then that might make you better. But mm. if you're great and you start having a high turnover of, of people... Because you get better as players and your combinations and your team morale gets better and better and better. So, Here's a weird question for you, but... I, I kind of wanted to ask you. So, well, no, that's not that weird. We've asked a lot weirder. Yeah. Um, does does winning ever get boring? Does winning ever get exhausting? And have you ever felt a moment where complacency is creeping up on you and you, it pulls your pants down, and you've got to try and keep that at bay, personally as a squad, collectively? No, I don't think winning gets boring. I think you know we're all sort of really competitive and and everything we do, whether it's you know down to just small games in training, you know, we we want to win. Um, what was the second question? Just that, that, that sort of, I mean, you can answer it, John, as well, because yeah. you've been there, you know, in, as part of these winning machines where y you know everything that you're doing at the moment is going in the right direction and you're top of the league and you're going for more trophies and trophies and trophies, but you can sense compl complacency creeping up on you yeah. and you have to keep it away. Yeah. Well, I did, I, I, my biggest moment of complacency creeping up on us was not, it was not in the shadows, it was right there in front of us. Is mm. um, Nick Fozard, one of our star sort of props at the time, we were, we were practicing really hard in training. We were like competing. I think there was a bit of a blow up in a game, you know, something hadn't gone quite right. And, and uh, Foz just sat back and went, lads, relax. We're the champions. <laughs> Let them catch us. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> uh, I, I guess on the subject of, um, and we've talked about it so much on this podcast, haven't we, over the last is it four or four years? That's some surprises me. I'm amazed, I'm amazed that people still listen to it. Um, keeping hold of homegrown talent, because something, John, you're, you've been very passionate about, but the fact that Saints have managed to keep most of their homegrown players over the last three, four years, just post the sort of Holbrook era, says it all, doesn't it? The, yeah, fact, yeah. You know, the fact that they are keeping the NRL vultures away. I know we've well, had COVID. In, 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 I would say this, in the easiest recruitment period of the club's history, mm. do you want to win trophies? Do you want to be at the best club in the Super League? Sign here. Well, yeah, mm. the answers to those questions are usually yes. Mm. You know, but I can the, pay the you maddest, four times One more, of the maddest decisions here. I've had in, seen in a few years is James Bentley going to Leeds. I just, it blows my mind. Was that m more so that he was a Leeds lad and wanted to represent? It's more. It's more I've won. Now I want to go back and play for. Oh, it's, yeah, more as a childhood dream to play for. Yeah, Leeds no, I get it. Yeah. I get it. I just thought it's a big. Well, no, and, actually, and a bit more money. Actually, a big call for him. So mm. fair on, fair play to him for making it. Mm. I just think, from as an outsider looking in, I was like, oh my god, mm. he's leaving it, Saints it, now. Is, is that less of a temptation? Obviously, when when you're winning and when the trophies are coming. But and I, I don't know. Maybe it, COVID has played a big part in, yeah. in the middle of it, with people not wanting to, not being able to, to switch countries, and, and it's, it's been a massive slapped cock in the middle of, of the, the sport, isn't it? Could have used there another analogy there. I there we go. Well, nothing else to use. Takes about forty minutes. In my head. <laughs> Always on your mind, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. But it, it's, I guess it's less of a temptation. Yeah. Obviously, you know, you're playing well, and, and I think we've got, you know, a really sort of special group of. Um, you know, we, we haven't really got many egos. We've got a lot of players. Do you that, have any egos you want to name? Well, there's Big Al. Is yeah. the, 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 the big Al he's the ego, ego, and there's yeah. Al Wormsley. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> you know, only, only messing. But we are, I think, as a group, we're we're all sort of team first, and um, you know, I think there is a sort of a special feel around it, and um, I think when you're all 
sort of going in the same sort of direction. Um, you know, you, you want to be a part of that, and um, you, know, you, you obviously have offers and you could look to go elsewhere, but you know, sometimes the grass isn't always greener, is it? And mm. you, you know, I think I definitely know, you know, when I've got it a good, and you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, you, you said it there before. You said if if Saints were rubbish, yeah, your life would be easier. You know, yeah, because yeah, you yeah. because you'd be able to be critical and whatever, and it's well, very not, hard to be. No, it's very hard to, to pick bones in this current Saints setup. It, it, so, but it's also your job to sort of predict and see when the grenade is going to be thrown in there, and actually, yeah. the next heir to the throne rises because that yeah. will happen eventually. Yeah, no, it will, and I just don't see it happening anytime soon because James Roby's going to retire. Morgan is going to take that over. Morgan is in the image of James in terms of the effort areas that Saints value. Recruitment's been really good. I've seen it through the course of history is how this goes wrong is a couple of bad recruitment decisions, mm. one or two, and then it slides a bit and then there's maybe a panic recruitment decision. Then all of a sudden your team's 20, 30 percent worse than it was. And that's how it happens over time. Mm. But you've just got to be acutely aware of what's coming and the future planning and consistency of coaching. You know, Justin Holbrook to... Um, to Christian Wolf was like a nice transition, actually. I think Justin had a different way. Christian Wolf's come in and added something else. And finding the right coach, recruiting the right coach, is 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 huge for sports teams. It's everything. It's just everything for successful teams. Mm. Getting that wrong is fundamentally just. It's like picking the wrong direction on a ship that you're sailing on. You know, that's it's just that. Mm. You know, Morgs' his dad just sailing off to Ireland in his little <laughs> one. That's what it's like, you know what I mean? He'll be back in 10 days, 12 days, who knows? He's been delivering he, milk. You know, he was actually paddling behind those uh, canoeists that faked their death. He was. Remember those two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Was, Did that, they get that was the expedition. I think they're still out there. They're st <laughs> bobbing around. <laughs> still, <laughs> bobbing around. It was the same canoe club, true story. <laughs> um, look, so, you, look, Morgan, you were named in the Super League Dream Team for the third straight season. Um, runner-up in the Players' Player of the Year award. Do you do you foresee it'd be a great picture, a bit like Brady, just having rings on every single finger, and 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 you know, bearing in mind you're 25, that is quite feasible, isn't it? You got three. How many fingers you got? You're from Cumbria, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, just three on <laughs> just each three, hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Halfway there. <laughs> but that's the dream, isn't it? I mean, that's everything you would have ever, ever, and, and more, I imagine, already, even if it ended today. Yeah, obviously, you know, I want more success, um, you know, as a group going forward. Um, but don't sort of look any further forward than, than than what's in front of us this year. You know, we've got an amazing opportunity now um, to go four in a row that no one's ever done before, mm. and you know that sort of puts it out of any doubt then that you know we we are probably the best team that that, that has been in Super League, and um, you know I'm looking forward and excited of of that challenge and that opportunity that we've got. Yeah. They're, they're a really interesting debate. The greatest team to have played Super League, the greatest Premier well, League team, the greatest cricket you've side. Got, you've got they? to judge them on the era that they were playing. Mm -hmm. And at the minute, they're so dominant in this last three or four years. I Are they as dominant as Leeds were? Probably the same at the minute. They're all, both on three. Because the Leeds fans but, listen but to this just, saying, what listen, are you talking about? We've not about? listened to what Moggs has said, though. I think if they win this year, yeah. they are the best side Correct. in Super League history. Correct. Well, his, yeah, factually they are, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, and well? also yeah. probably, if you look at the record over the last five years, it's probably the best record in Super League history already mm. without having the stats to hand. Well, you said win percentage. I think it is the best win percentage in the history of Super League, isn't I it? I think so, yeah. yeah. I've seen, seen some stats points somewhere. Points accumulated in a season, that. win percentage, points conceded. So go on, you're the pundit. Where are the weaknesses? Where, where the does team. it start? Where does it, I know you talk about recruitment. That's the potential where it, it could fall apart. But currently... Where do you pick a hole? Well, look, injuries, long-term injuries play a huge part. You know, half-back, you know, they've got uh, Lewis Dodd, you know, Johnny Lomax, they get an injury there. It's going to force some sort of change in the squad. Somebody's going to have to play out of position. Mm -hmm. And, that, you know, those are the things in the short term that could affect Saints' yeah, performance. If, if in really... the long term, it's, it's the selection of the next coach is huge, the succession of the young players and getting unbelievable overseas recruits. Sione Matau is... If you want to play with a guy, play with him. Mm. He, you talk about recruitment. This is where Saints get it right. Is they've got a guy there who is killing it from overseas, doing it the right way, and, and, and they've got recruitment right, and they didn't mm. get it right. We've been at the club. Saints got the recruitment wrong badly. Mm. Signed Josh Perry, who just stretched for three years or whatever. Mm. You know, like, we've had players who've just come and just rinsed 200 grand out the game and disappeared. Stretched I didn't for three years. I not even stretch, actually. No. But you know Very what I'm saying? Guy. I'm not saying Saints get it right. Clubs get it wrong all the time. 
You know, and Saints have got it laughably mm. wrong. Yeah. If times. you were to really clutch at straws this season, I think you'd be in, inexperienced in key positions. I think Lewis Dodd, Jack Wells would be great players. The only thing I could even foresee, foresee as a weakness would be the inexperience playing consistently for a full season. But I yeah. think those are going to be superstars. Yeah. Look, a, a, a topical debate, and I know you, I mean, you haven't really had a bee in your bonnet over the last 40 minutes or so, have you, John? But and something you want to talk about, mm. um, as well, something I want to ask you about, actually, as well, is and not just in rugby league, but we'll start there, but it's the sort of sanitising of sport in yeah. general. Um, you know, so the rugby league example being kind of legal implications um, and safety procedures coming in to to avoid litigation yeah. in the future. And we, we know a group obviously last year got together and talked about concussive injuries and life-changing injuries. Uh, and look, we've seen that in other sports as well. But there's a fine balance to where that has to start and stop, isn't there? Yeah, for sure. And I think what we've seen in the opening rounds of Super League is, is, is uh, a lot of players getting banned. Um, a lot of incidents that maybe weren't deemed as illegal being classed as illegal. Cards off the back of it. And I think when I was sort of thinking about it, I was like, well, Where's the, you know, where's this coming from? You know, to make the game safer. Rugby's inherently dangerous. You know, UFC is dangerous. Do we see them ref reforming, like, a lot of their laws? No, if anything, I feel like it's more brutal. Like, rugby league is a violent sport. It's a dangerous sport. If you're going to play it, you're going to get hurt. If you're going to send your kids to rugby, they're going to bleed. They're going to have operations. They're going to break an arm or a leg. They're going to get knocked out. That's the fact. So what we're trying to do is remove all the risk. And what my point about sport is, look, there's an element of that is part of the fabric of the sport. I'm all for protecting players' safety. Like, I get it. Um, but it's just where the responsibility lies. And I'm also, do we let medics and lawyers dictate how a game looks going forward? You know, because if we're trying to cover up for litigation that's coming down the track, where does that stop? Because rugby league's never going to be safe. Mm. So what we're doing is just taking away the main things that we think might get us in trouble in court and cleaning it up. But it's got to be good to watch, mm. Flash, hasn't it? Whatever they come out with at the yeah. end of it, it's got to be good There's, to watch. There was a couple of incidents that I was surprised and disappointed with. The, the opening kickoff to Super League when Gil Dudson got tackled, I think someone put his, put his hand in his face and he kind of wriggled three. He didn't throw a punch, but he pushed someone off him and he got a yellow card. I think there needs to be an element of, a very small element of, there's a bit of niggle going on the field. As long as it's not too dangerous, let it go because it's, it's becoming ridiculous. If, every, if teams are getting simbing at every conceivable opportunity, it's just ruining yeah. the spectacle. And I think... Some referees haven't played the game and they don't know what it's like in the middle of the field because there is, there's a bit of intimidation going on. There's a bit of machoism that you need to let some goes on because otherwise it's, it's like if someone touches you, you, you you're crying to the referee and mm. grassing on someone, and you don't want that as a as a byproduct of of, of over over cautioning players. Uh, and I think just a little bit of benefit of the doubt to, to players rather than just cautioning every opportunity. Yeah. Morgan, it's difficult to put you on the spot because obviously, you know, you've got to be careful what you say as well. But where, where does that sit to someone who's currently playing? Because these guys are at the opposite end of their careers. Yeah, it's a fine line, I think, um, you know, with looking after players and, and, and sort of protecting them and not having some of the, you know, horrible injuries that, you know, can happen. But I will call said it's, it's why I fell in love with the game. I like the physicality, the brutality of it. As, as a fan, that's what I want to see. I want to see big hits, big tackles, you know, the odd bit of biff, like that's what's exciting. And I think if we're trying to grow the game, you know, you- It's imperative, isn't it, that they keep- about Yeah, because that's, that's what people want to watch. And I think you can, you know, you've got to tread carefully on that line that you don't go too far the other way. It, I mean, it's look, if you take a gladiatorial nature out of anything, any sport like that, it, it's, it's like you say, it's not, it's not going to encourage growth is it in, in an audience I mean look Formula One's an example because it wasn't long ago where it was a bit like Ben-Hur Formula One going around a track and it was kind of like you know a few chariots ben crossed Hur's the line and they were picking up the rest of the bodies have you seen Ben-Hur no. No. No, no 
watch it. <laughs> we're only young, aren't we, Margaret? We're yeah. not seeing stuff like that. Classic. But, you know, now, obviously, they, you throw in halos and you throw in bigger tyres and every year. And obviously, that the balance that I'm talking about is people's yeah. safety and you're still losing drivers like Jules Bianchi yeah. in the 20th century. Well, the so. gladiatorial nature of rugby league is one of its massive draws. And during the early 2000s, Stuart Field and Barry McDermott had a massive rivalry and it would overflow sometimes, mm. but people would tune in to watch it. Now, I don't think they should get rid of that gladiatorial inst instinct of players and let them, there should be a little bit of niggle, a little bit of animosity between mm. players rather than just ruling everything out because it's it ruins a spectacle massively. Is yeah, it's it in three, danger of that, It's three-game ban now for punching. Mm. Eight mm. games if you punch somebody unprovoked. You would yeah. have lasted a season with you. No, I didn't do it. Well, Gil Dudson, as an example, I know I'm not sticking up for him because he's my teammate, former teammate, but he kind of pushed someone off him with, not with a closed fist. He didn't do any damage whatsoever, and he got Simbin. So if that keeps happening, little moments are just going to be eradicated. I suppose the, ar the argument would be that to get it out of the game, mm. you've got to punish people. Yeah. My question is, do we want that out of the game? No. Do, do, do we do really? Do players want it out of the game? Like I said, it's just it's treading that line, isn't it? Mm. I think, um, you know... <laughs> Don't want to talk about two incidents, but you look at the Luke Gale one on, on Johnny Lomax yeah. that you know not intentional but could have been really nasty, you know, could have could have broke his leg, whatever. So those things, yeah, you want them out of the game. Yeah. But you know, like Flash said, the one with Gil Dudson, a bit of that start of the game, that's you know, you you just let that flow, let that go. That's what they want, that's what we want, and yeah. it's you're just sort of getting into it and yeah, you're stopping is, it all the this time. Is the thing with players, I think players and fans don't want an awful lot to change, then, then the game is changing it. What because it's protecting the welfare of the players who are unable to protect themselves. Well, I think if if you start playing rugby league, it doesn't take you long to realise it's going to mess your body around, does it? Like you know, do you remember when you start playing professionally and you're in the pass, you're in the lounge after the game and all the past players are there? Mm. You spot a guy whose nose is spread across his face. He, he can't he, he can't limp. He can hardly pick a pint. He, you know, he's dragging his foot behind him. You know, you can hardly speak, Kaiser and Solzhen. you're like, oh, no, yeah, he used to play rugby league. It's like, well, I worked out pretty quick that that's what you end up looking like. You yeah. know what you're signing up for, yeah. don't you? Yeah, it's look, personal, look at, look at the, well, it's look personal at the Pittsburgh Steelers players in the 70s in the NFL, you know, when we talk about concussion in the film that Will Smith did. You yeah, know, there, yeah. there, is a, there is a balance there, isn't there? Is, there? there is, and concussion is the big thing. We don't know anything about it. Still, we're trying to understand it, and we don't know the long-lasting effects yeah. of it. Mm. But there's just a real balance to be had in getting that right because once you start stripping it back mm. I just feel like is the game that entertaining yeah do you know what I mean have, have you been made more aware of that as in like have you had officials come in and talk to you and sort of you know debrief on what what is going to happen this season in terms of bans in terms of tackles in terms yeah, of yeah well, I don't think the rules have changed it's just the the, the sanctions are different you yeah. know what would have been a, a grade A is a grade B and a grade B is now grade C and yeah. in game you know you're going to get penalties you know quicker and easier for, for certain infringements and stuff. So, you know, we we know that, but it's, yeah, you, you, you just got to be careful. It, it doesn't go too far the other way and spoil, you know, the, the spectacle that it is. I think, yeah, the, the referees and the referee and authority need to understand the impact that penalties have on the game. Yeah. Because to get out your own half when all penalties are really hard, it becomes an arm wrestle. You got to, you got to work your asses off. Mm. But if there's willy, uh, penalties for willy nilly, the teams, the players can, can act up or dive or whatever to get out of their own half. It's just, it ruins the balance of a game and it yeah. really pisses me off. Uh, tell, and tell me, because I, I don't know the answer to this, but in, in terms of with the World Cup around the corner, then how does it work on, you know, being, yeah. being officiated by well, it's not, world officials well, rather than It's RFL. not quite in line with the NRL. The NRL has, mm. has tried to, to do this as well, mm. it, but it's slightly different, the interpretation of laws. You know, what about Tonga playing in Manchester? And you know, when you know, we it, all, Yeah, well, it's going to be refereed, they're going to choose a set of rules and it'll be refereed by them and the mm. punishments for the World Cup will be slightly different to Super League, to NRL. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's... Um, it changes the dynamic of a team, doesn't it? And we're talking about you being one of the physical players in the league and, and though, well, it affects so, those the most. The unintended consequence of it is that it changes behaviours within the game. I'm just... It's very soon now, isn't it? It's mm. just in a year's time, are we going to see more players feigning injury? Are we going to see, you know, is there going to be, you know, just more players leaving the pitch? You know, is there going to be more bands, longer bands? We haven't got a big talent pool anyway. Mm. I just think we look, player safety is huge and we need to make sure that's right. The concussion protocols are like they've never been before, but the game can't make up for the fact it had nothing in place 10 years ago. Mm. So changing things now, 
is shutting the gate after the horse has not just bolted, the horse has fucked right off. Yeah. Mm. It's gone. Yeah. Mm. So I'm just saying, whether that's part of the decision making or not, we've just got to make sure that we don't, there's a law of unintended consequences. We change this now, what's the consequences? And the consequences have got to be greater than the change. Some yeah. of the best players and most entertaining players were your enforcers, your Sam Burgess, your Adrian Morley's, who'd go out there and intimidate an opponent, put big hits on and really get the crowd off the feet. Yeah. If they carry on the way they're going, they won't have those kind of players in the game, yeah. which will be sad. Look, massive year for you, Morgan, obviously going for a fourth grand final victory, but also with the World Cup around the corner and as well. The, and the Airbnb. And, and the, the Airbnb Where business, which is called? the local yeah. air hideout. How many bedrooms? bedrooms. Yeah. Two beds. Oh, nice Hot tub outside. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> lovely. Ooh, lovely. Have you uh, christened the hot tub? Oh, uh, I've been in it, yeah. Yeah, that's what I, I meant. That's what you meant. That's what it was nice. Yeah. What yeah. did you think? Look, on the World Cup, I mean, firstly, cash. when you played for Wales, did you just think you were going to be too shit to play for England? At the time, yeah, you know, yeah. there was I was never going to get picked for England. I was never anywhere near that sort of setup. Um, and my mum's mum's side of the family's Welsh, and um, you know that's it was proud for me to sort of represent them. And how well should we talk? Just you know, sort of as a Welsh test. Can she speak Welsh, your mum? You can't speak Welsh, but she's, she's Welsh, still she? got a Welsh accent, even though she's she, not been living in valleys for uh, well 20, I mean, 30 years. When when you changed, did you sort of find? Sheep's head being posted through the the, the B and B in the Lake District. <laughs> no, there must I, have been some some angry Welsh people out there. You know, it was all right to be fair. You know, I, I spoke to John, um, and you know, he, he he was fully sort of supporting of it. And um, at the end of the day, I'm I'm a proud Cumbrian, and it was England that I wanted to play for. Yeah. Um, so under that opportunity come up. Um, yeah, that was all I was going to do. And it's massive, isn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm not yeah, involved well. in the sport like you guys, but I'm, I'm so excited for it. And the fact that it's going to happen the same, pretty much the same timings yeah, as it was supposed amazing. to be last year. It's just an amazing year. It's an amazing Super League year building into a World Cup, isn't it? Because inevitably, when you domestic competition's going on and the World Cup's at the end of the year, you mm. start getting lads who are just like producing performances out of nowhere. Somebody will just be a bolter, you know, will end up making the squad who's like, just blows everyone's minds this year. Mm. That's like the coolest thing about sport. Has it? there been that extra motivation from you and other lads who want to get in that squad? Have you, have you noticed something in yourself or other people? Um, I think, you know, if, I can only sort of speak for myself really, but you know that's at the end of it and, and obviously you want to be performing anyway, but it, it is that sort of carrot at the end of the year that, you know, I want to be performing well, you know, for, for Saints and, and in doing that then, you know, I'm going to put my best foot forward to being for selection and, and I presume that's for, you know, other lads that, that are there or thereabouts. Well, yeah. relax. You're the, you're the best loose forward. Relax yeah, with a champion. Let, let them catch you. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, that just, just to sort of finish, I guess, that it's, it's quite an intense year. For someone who I know you've you've been at the forefront of it for the last few years, but you're not a sort of ten year veteran of playing Super League and in playing in World Cups. Where where's the switch off time and so on in a in a year that is just relentless because you know, when you finish after the grand final you're straight into a World Cup. Yeah, I think it's hard. It's a it's a long year this year, you know. We could potentially be playing, you know, close to forty games. Um, what do you do? What you know, what, what's that point games? where you, you go and sit be, in the dark yeah, cover, finals. Do you, do you do any mindfulness? Do you meditate? What do you do just to switch off from it? Because it's, um, it, it's relent it never stops, does it? I th no, I think when, when I go home, I'm, I'm quite good at sort of switching off, and um, you know, I've, I've got a three-month-old baby, so he's he's keeping me pretty busy at the minute, and um, that's not switching off. Okay. No, That's but it's, it's uh, you know it's a mental sort of deload from from thinking about rugby and playing. Um, Any outdoor pursuits with your dad? Set <laughs> your mind off it? No, not as much as I like. I'd like to you know I get I get up the lakes as, as much as I can and, and go out walking. Um, but yeah, just you know when I can, you just you just got to try and switch off because it can yeah. become sort of all-consuming. Yeah, and look, the man who's going to lead that has already called in the next Sean O'Loughlin. Has he got the potential? Yeah. I mean, you said he's the best player in Super League right now. Has he got the potential to surpass O'Loughlin's talents, John? Yeah, he, he's there already. Really? Yeah. He's, he does all the things lockers could do. He's and like, I mean, he's I mean, had a sensational career. I mean, what I would career. say is that Morgs has got a lot of skill that you don't see as much of as he can do. Mm -hmm. As his body gets a bit more further down the track in his career, maybe the subtlety of his skill, you know, you start using that a bit more maybe. Lockers by the end of his career was a, 
a ball playing loose, but was smart, you know, played nine games and then he had five or six games out. And what, you know, the older Moors gets, the more he'll have to refine into the, like, the vintage wine that was Sean O'Loughlin. But yeah. Moggs is Moggs is ripe, ready to drink right he's now. A, Let's a, drink him up. Shatter enough. To drink him up. Yeah. Drink new, it up. New drink age it wine. You'll never see anything like this again. No, no. Um, so final question for you. When you are in the nursing home, um, hope we could all be there together. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Playing a bit of backgammon if we still know the rules. Easy. And you know, you're rocking back and forward. You're in the Lake District. You're looking out to the window. The young canoeists setting out on a new, a new adventure. What What do you want to look back on this incredible career that you've still got ahead of you and that you've sort of already half completed? To 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 look back on with the memories you want to. Um, yeah, I'd like to be able to finish and and. And I have plenty of memories, and I have already, you know, to sort of make make some more. And um, you know, I think what what sort of drives me is is being respected by you know my teammates. Um, you know, I think finishing and and you know, and then knowing that the lads you played with, you know, could say, oh yeah, Morgan's a good lad. Yeah, enjoyed playing with him or you know, whatever. And um, yeah, I'd sit back and be pretty happy with that. Morgan Knowles, you're a wonderful man. Thank you so much for coming in, mate. Oh, thank you. Um, Enjoyed it. Enjoyed the rest of the season. And like I say, massive, massive year. And we'll be watching from not, not too afar. You'll be watching very closely. I can't wait for the, the first time that John has to criticise Morgan Knowles for a mistake, a I critical mistake for England in the World Cup final. I can do it. You What's the holiday it? letting called again? <laughs> Lake Away Hideout. Lake Away Hideout. <laughs> do we get mates rates? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we we'll about 15 plugs. Yeah, Do you want to just put a flag? We we'll just put a little graphic. Yeah, yeah we'll just send, get send it across the screen. Point, just point to the get. Just the run it across the <laughs> You can see it going across the ticker at the bottom there. Morgan, top man, mate. Thank you so much. No, cheers, thank you. Bob. Cheers. Legend.